Welcome so, back, Olga. Uh, we were discussing uh, recently uh, you know, what more can we explain about DC potential, especially how it's been studied in, in Russia and former Soviet Union. And one of the aspects that we also see being of great interest in the performance world uh, is the aspect of mental fatigue and how that could be potentially measured objectively with some physiological data. And that kind of gave us the, the idea of, of talking about the, the psychophysiological aspects of DC potential. But before we go specifically to that topic, should we maybe start with a very brief recap of what is DC potential? Okay, um, hello again, and thank you for inviting me. It's very nice to, to present for you, and I hope I can really describe some main um, basic ideas here. Um, actually, I was planning to uh, start immediately from the history of concepts, okay. and um, then we go slowly, step by step, to DC potential. But just in two words, so DC potential is very slow uh, frequency potential, or basically it's DC shift, which is registered in the frequency range from 0 to 0 0.5 hertz. And uh, actually, it's known for a really long time, since um, 50s of last century, and even maybe earlier, there was some work done about this. But then, uh, uh, due to uh, some um, new inventions of uh, possibility to filter the signal of EEG. So we forget for a while for about this um, very low frequencies. Yeah. But in Russia, uh, we still was interested in this. And, uh, you know, our country was, uh, has very strong physiological school. And uh, performance is, it was always a priority for Russian researchers. And that's why quite a lot of things was done in this direction. And particularly, we also study very low frequency potentials. Mm -hmm. So from the zero to zero five. Uh, that's why maybe uh, there is some gap between the Western world and Russian uh, neuroscience or neurophysiology. Uh, we have really solid background, but unfortunately the most of work was done in time when it was Soviet Union and many things was published in Russian books and work and uh, really unbelievably good work that can help everybody. Oh, nothing is in, first of all, it's in Russian, it's not in electronic format, right? Uh, not everything, it's slightly coming to the electronic format also, but not so much of us, yeah. especially. So, but uh, nowadays actually, we have a boom of DC potential or infra low frequency potentials generally. Uh, because uh, uh, we identify infra slow fluctuations in fMRI. And first, we also try to filtrate it out. But then uh, researchers realize that, aha, there is some point there. And the whole story of um, infra slow frequencies begin again. So now uh, I can say that uh, it's growing number of publication, and I will try to show some graphs later how many publications done during the last 10 years. And we know much more now about how it looks like and what can be the reason and uh, what actually we measure in this frequency range. So um, as I mentioned already, we are uh, talking today about uh, neuroenergometry. And I would like to, to tell you about the history of concept and um, uh, the present situation about this um, topic. As I already mentioned, we have very so solid physiological school mm -hmm. in Russia. And to understand all this infra slow uh, idea, I really would like to go back in history and start from Ivan Pavlov who besides the reflexes also um, did many other things. And particularly he introduced body integrity concept. 
he talked that body, human body is unified, ever-changing, self-regulating, self-restoring system, right? Uh, he also believed that brain is the main control center and internal organs, they uh, have an um, interconnection with the brain, with cerebral cortex, and um, uh, they interact by a system named interoception. And actually all vegetative functions and processes that occur in the body, they are registered and processed in the brain. Also autonomic nervous system, also endocrine gland, digestive system, everything has interaction with the brain and uh, modern science already supported. Before we only uh, had the theories and of course we had a lot of uh, research and publications and data uh, that tell us that um, it is exist especially in um, animals and also something in human. But now we have even more evidence about all this interoception, a communication between the brain and the body. So this is very important for us to understand that everything interconnected and we can just talk about one system and another system separately. Then uh, with, uh, I would like to uh, introduce you other Russian physiologist, uh, Pyotr Anokhin, who, who introduced functional systems. And this is something that all Russian uh, neurophysiologists and physiologists is, uh, actually many of our theories and research, uh, they based on these ideas. So he believed that um, uh, uh, the human body consists of a set of functionally combined structure and processes that ensure interactions and dynamic restructuring of activities. What does it mean? So it means that um, every uh, particular time, uh, our, uh, our body recruit some system to perform something. Like for example, for locomotion or breathing. Um, let's say breathing is still something out, more or less automatic system, right? but still we can consciously suppress the breathing. We can regulate sometimes breathing. And it means that there is some other uh, systems involved. So um, uh, if we, for example, uh, need to produce some um, complex movement, it means that there is some uh, cortical structures involved, some cortical structures involved, and also body functions involved. And this is not just that. He also mentioned that um, functional system created when different parts of this system, they are uh, simultaneously activated and activated enough. For example, uh, let's say you wake up in the morning and you would like to grab something or throw the ball. And then you realize that like, you can actually use your muscle effectively. You want it. So you, you have some connection. You know that there's nothing wrong with your muscle, but you can't do it because your uh, distant system is not ready. It's not excited uh, in, um, or activated enough. So that means uh, functional system. To perform something, all parts of the functional system should be in particular state, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. So, um, and there is uh, like two type generally system. One is provide homeostatic, uh, more or less um, uh, reflective systems. Uh, for example, blood pressure, temperature control, etc. And uh, they interacting in more, in between uh, peripheral neurons, neuronal systems and uh, central regulators to um, create homeostatic uh, balance in our body. And then there is also functional system two, which all, already involves behavior. So if, it, uh, if uh, uh, one system we can describe, like let's say, um, uh, with some uh, sort of um, infection, <laughs> now it's <laughs> important, right? We have uh, all our immune system is stimulated and then the temperature increase to fight with intruders. So we try to compensate with this and it's one type of functional system involved. But if uh, let's say uh, someone is hungry or uh, he needs to fight 
for the wife or whatever, then there is some behavior uh, involved. And it's totally different system. Of course, there is still some part of the uh, internal regulators will be participating, but then it's involved extra functional system. Why we are talking so much about these functional systems? Because uh, actually everything what we perform uh, depend on the um, level of activation of the systems. And if they work in balance, and if everything's sufficiently activated, so I mean the regulatory system or type of system one, and other system for performance, if they are combined and regulated, then we have a project. So the next concept, and this is also important, it's a concept of dominant focus proposed by Uchtomsky. And this dominant is also very important because it's create temporarily uh, focus in the nerve centers or dominant centers uh, with increased, increased excitability. And what it does, it, uh, if it's um, formed, then it suppresses all unneeded activities or all unneeded um, excitation. How I can explain it? For example, you are in cocktail party. This cocktail party effect um, uh, explain attention, but attention is a state of dominant focus, actually. So what happened during this time? If you are uh, concentrated on some topic or you discuss with some um, colleague or you just want to hear that uh, someone important talking, maybe not even with you, it means you can't hear anybody else. You may not even see who, who is nearby, who is passing through, because this is not so important for you. It's dominance. Also, uh, uh, dominance means that if there is some uh, physiological need, like mm, hunger in the, in the case, or I don't know, some other things, mm, it can be so strong that even if you have some important work or you need to do some exercise and other things, you will just try to uh, compensate this dominant as fast as possible, grab something small to eat, just to, uh, to uh, stop this excitation, to be able to perform and do the next thing. And this is also very important for us, this dominant concept, because it has um, uh, some sort of resistance, of course, and uh, other uh, things like I just explained, like for example, if you would like to eat, but at the same time you're really we have a lot of work and there is some discussion and there is something else, some work-related issues. So you try to compensate dominant, which is the most important at the moment, as fast as possible to do something else. Uh, so other things, they stimulate and they uh, uh, create the possibility to resolve your dominance faster. But also what's important, I'm sorry? Is the dominant focus, is it... Uh... Conscious, unconscious, or can be both? Can be both. Mm -hmm. You you never know. Like for you know, from the fraud, we know that there is can be some dominant focus, and we can't even understand what is it. So we want something, and uh, then if we have um, two opposite things in the same time, they can create conflict, and it means that there is. Um, two centers which try to compete who is the most dominant at the moment and what we need to do first. So this Would it be many... possible with, I mean, conscious, with conscious decision override unconscious need? Meaning you could, ex extreme example, you haven't eaten in three days, you are super hungry, but by conscious decision, you're still going to, study for the exam right exactly you can do it but again with what cost because if you have somewhere some part of excitation it means it will take resources all the time just imagine it's some some sort of hot point in your brain so some sort of um, some part of your brain is activated and all the time bumping that it's needed to resolve this activation because it's already recruit some part of the functional system to resolve it, but you consciously suppress it, but it's still there. And when the cost becomes too high, even 
even even even after multiple conscious decisions eventually the body will catch up and you will pay yes. that price absolutely this for sure and there is other many interesting things can happen especially with hunger but we don't go there yeah. today <laughs> at least yeah but this is true okay so and uh, the one more thing uh, as i already mentioned so this uh, dominant can form a uh, long term acceptability um, maybe you experience or someone experience uh, with overtraining or let's say overload for the work or exam or something like this, uh, sometimes even during the night, you still have the situation. Like uh, there was a record and some experiment um, when they try to understand how this all work. Uh, so they uh, describe it like uh, some uh, uh, runner was still running in his dream and in the morning, he had sore uh, muscles as much as he was really doing something. And it happened. It means that uh, there's some uh, activity wasn't suppressed and didn't resolve for some reason. That's when we talk about uh, uh, the functional state, right? He go to this um, excitation state. Mm -hmm. He was too excited or his motor state. Uh, areas was activated uh, extremely and um, well, externally we didn't see any any running from the person but internally right. it, internal uh, as yeah. if he was running yes and this is actually also a very important thing to understand when we talk about sport performance because um Let's say we all, all, all the time when we talk about um, exercise and preparedness and stuff like this, we often forget that body is one story. But when we talk about brain, like we just mentioned, we have some internal uh, thoughts, some kind of impulses, some vital function that we need to fulfill. There is uh, social interaction. There is some uh, processes like fears, for example, feel a fear of failure and stuff like this. So when some of them combined, performance can drop. And that's also one part of the mental, mental fatigue, what we talk in what you mentioned in the beginning. But this one reason why some people fail, just because uh, by um, understanding and measuring the body function, we not always can understand how what happened in the brain and what it costs to the brain to perform. So that's the main idea here. And uh, so the next thing what Uchtomsky also proposed is functional state. I already mentioned it today. Uh, so this means um, it reflects the capability of person in, uh, who is in particular state to perform a certain type of activity, right? So we already mentioned before that uh, functional systems created according with excitation of all parts, when different parts of the system, they are ready to perform, so it can be united and we can perform something. Here also, to um, functional state, we usually understand more about um, our like mental state uh, it's actually always when it come to the terms it's not easy but i don't go there i try to simplify it a little bit <laughs> it's a hard enough topic for today but still uh, just to understand when we talk about functional state uh, we talk about uh, the things like uh, deep sleep drowsiness um, relaxation concentration right but also uh, ready to perform or um, other kind of state can be um, rest state or operational rest. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more. Uh, so Uchtomsky was one of the first who was actually proposed uh, the idea that physiological relaxation is an active physiological uh, process. Because previously, uh, Western world, they usually talk, when they talk about relaxation, there's nothing going on, but this is not true. And now we know, now we know that if there is default mode network, there is silenced network, whatever network, uh, it means 
that even if you are in rest state, it doesn't mean that your physiological system stops working. They're still working and working hard, but just they recruit different functional system to clean up waste, to repair some muscles, and so on. So, and this um, ability to maintain a state of relaxation depends uh, quite heavily on the possibility to um, to suppress excitability or to be excited if it's needed. So, this flexibility make the um, uh, in healthy people. Uh, make it uh, possible to perform. For example, if the someone um, has some sickness, like normally we are quite flexible in our uh, uh, regulatory systems. We have some excitation and suppression and so on, right? Like in heart rate variability, it's understandable for most of our audience. So they know exactly that in heart rate, if it's a healthy person, it has it should be quite normal amount. You should have you should have variability. Yes. Yes, you should have variability. But if there is very high stress, variability drop, and if it's infection, variability drop. If there is some other uh, or mental sickness, variability also goes down. So that means that this reciprocal excitation and suppression is not flexible anymore enough. Yeah. And this also can be a reason for overtraining, for example, or some mental fatigue. For some reason, there is not uh, enough um, resources to suppress or activate um, and to, per to perform in the balanced state, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this physiological rest uh, we can understand can be um, related with minimal. Uh, muscle activation or with muscle relaxation. And then we talk about deep sleep, for example, drowsiness. And then there is another very important part, another important state, especially for the sport and performance, it's operational rest or alert calmness. This, uh, this type of um, state allows us to be ready to do something, but at the same time we, we suppress unwanted impulses. So this, we create some sort of dominant for this operational rest. Maybe like a little bit like alpha state or whatever. So um, in the brain, this functional state also supported by um, reticular formation is one structure um, in the brain, which is um, process sensory impulses and then activate cerebral cortex accordingly. And when we talk about, usually about uh, some uh, activation, we talk about that uh, reticular formation activate like frontal cortex or motor cortex or whatever, depending on what we need. Also attention focus provided by reticular formation. Like if you are in operational rest, reticular formation may not activate your context, uh, cortex enough. But if some un unusual stimulus comes from somewhere, it will activate and uh, it will also activate some part of the brain to process and to take an action if needed. Okay. So now uh, we go to the next um, uh, topic. Uh, we talk about a little bit about performance and uh, the state associated with performance. So you know this uh, graph. Um, for ideal, in ideal situation, uh, we have a state, now it's functional states during the performance, uh, which the name operational rest, we just talk about this, uh, so non-specific readiness for activities. Then we have mobilization, so we prepare our system and uh, we involve motivation and so on, so we try to, let's say, wake up from the bed. <laughs> Then we have an initial, initial reaction, the transition, uh, uh, when we are recruiting a functional system to perform. Then we have a hypermobilization, activation of all activities. So actually we execute some activities, we already start to do something. Then we have state of um, 
optimal compensation or flow state. At this state, we have best performance, right? Uh, if we continue to perform whatever, then uh, we're faced with subcompensation state, which is still uh, preserve uh, some resources in our body, but this is already the cost of compensation. So we have fatigue, but it compensated fatigue. We still can go a little bit or to some extent. Mm -hmm. these, can these states happen at any time of the day? Mm, sure. Sure. And how, so how do we know that these states exist? But what measurements from the body have been used to identify these states and label them? Electrophysiological activity, actually this done um, to identify the states, uh, the people did uh, um, ECG recordings, briefing recordings, EEG recordings. And not just brain. And but they the also brain. measure the performance, like reaction time, right. uh, state of, um, like also some questionnaires used, how the person really feel right. internally and so on. So in, in summary, these states are not just based on brain data. No, 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 of course not. not. Not just brain data. But like we talked from the beginning, brain is not just some separate part of the body. It's one part of the yeah, whole yeah. system, right? So, uh, and uh, now uh, if we talk about um, other graph, there is, uh, if you have a non-optimal uh, functional state, or let's say um, uh, our regulatory system they are not anymore so flexible for some reason. Uh, for example, in acute fatigue, we still can see more or less performance graph, which has happened in the same direction like this upper graph on, on the slide. Then we have the state of monotony. This is a very interesting state. And as you can see, it's all the time fluctuated, right? So the regulatory system state, like uh, they are not stable. There is going on something and performance is not stable. Uh, reaction time can be very strange and so on. It's also um, interesting state uh, because it can be illustrated, for example, from the um, uh, driver. Uh, uh, let's, um, let's remember, maybe you also had it sometimes when you drive for a long time. Mm -hmm you sometimes understand that you're doing it automatically. Mm. Like you're still driving, but like you are not uh, concentrating on what you are doing. And it happened uh, because the monotony uh, won't work, uh, bring you to the state of less activated uh, frontal activity and sensory system and everything. Our brain is very clever. They try to reserve as much resources as possible. So if it's unnecessary, and there is just one um, dominant <laughs> excitation in the motor um, functional system and the motor cortex, then it's assumed that we don't need so much, let's say, attention. But um, it creates errors and it creates, uh, we can have uh, slowing and reaction time. Yeah, yeah. And, other things. But, but um, one also clarifying question, when you have those four graphs, uh, the performance in non-optimal functional, are we looking at here, is the curve a DC potential curve? No, 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 no. It's only, now we talk about just uh, performance. Like the, this was done um, by people, they measured the performance, the type of reaction time. You could uh, even imagine that on the x-axis you might have, let's say, time. And on the y axis, you yeah. might have some performance, measure, some performance output, measurements, reaction time, right. whatever. You are. Right. Okay, okay. It's just important for us that, when, for example, if it's uh, uh, acute fatigue uh, later in the DC potential graphs, we can talk about this more. Uh, we may not see so much uh, difference it still can go to the normal state very quickly but if we have this monotony state and it's chronic state we may see some imbalance or in chronic fatigue we have some 
deficiency already because people they try to work in subcompensation mm -hmm. and stress create other problems. So it's just an illustration of uh, how complex actually performance is and how many components there. And uh, everything what we talk today, I try to simplify as um, uh, as possible because this is really uh, yeah, the human body is not a, a, a linear mechanistic uh, apparatus like right. engineering. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, so um, <laughs> we talk quite a lot about the systems and um, brain and stuff like this, but actually um, another important thing and um, what it bring us closer and closer to the DC potential is the energy regulation systems in the brain. Uh, we all know that brain uh, is the most energy consumption, uh, com the consuming part of the body. It uses over 20% of all our body energy. And also uh, neuronal activity um, require constant and unlimited energy supply. With increased neuronal activity, energy was, uh, the supply increased and it's provided to us by uh, increasing local cerebral blood flow. Uh, so how the cerebral blood flow regulated then? Uh, it's regulated by uh, fluctuation in CO2 level in anterior blood. blood. It's also um, uh, regulated through the cerebral metabolism or exchange in the level of oxygen, uh, glucose, lactate. It's uh, depend of uh, arterial blood pressure, neurogenic activity, of course, and also the cardiac output. Uh, and uh, during uh, submaximal or moderate and maximal exercise, what actually happened with um, uh, cerebral blood flow? Uh, uh, the regulation of blood flow in the brain uh, in this situation with uh, excessive exercises, uh, it's uh, provided with balance between level of CO2 and cerebral metabolism. Also, uh, cerebral uh, metabolism rate related to increase or decrease in neurogenic activity. It's also understandable. So increased neurogenic activity, they need more O2, they need glucose, they need other nutrition and so on. But what is interesting that actually, uh, even though that cerebral blood flow increase in parallel with ex exercise intensity, but it has some limit. So about the 60% of maximum oxygen uptake, then the uh, cerebral blood flow is not increased anymore. It's called the plateau or even go to to down. And um, actually, uh, there is mm, quite interesting discussion all the time in the papers and publications. If the cerebral blood flow uh, increased uh, and how it decreased, and if the arterial blood pressure in the brain increased dramatically during exercise and so on. But actually, uh, our brain um, is. Um, uh, made so that there, it tried to prevent any surge in the uh, blood arterial blood pressure. So even though there is uh, maximal intensity, the blood pressure increased about 15%, at least according with data, what you see in the recent publications. So it's very important because uh, brain tried to uh, be as, cost, as constant as possible in all way. So how this uh, all uh, delivered to the neurons uh, and how actually what happened in the brain. So we have blood-brain barrier and brain capillaries, they, they have a little different uh, anatomy than other capillaries in the body. Uh, they are very super tight. The only uh, things that can penetrate through the endothelial cells is the ox it's oxygen, um, it's water, and uh, it's CO2. Uh, so the glucose, amino acids, electrolytes, everything provided to neurons through the uh, glial cells, through the astrocytes. And also, uh, 
our neurons, they need calcium and natrium to perform at a certain level. And they can uh, get it through the interstitial space filled by lymph. And lymph is very, very similar to blood plasma, but it's originated from different structure. It's created in the brain. Mm-hmm. So uh, we call it glymphatic system. And uh, it's very interesting situation actually, because um, recently it was uh, discovered that we have um, uh, well, this very developed um, lymphatic system in the brain. And um, this system pro- not only uh, provides some nutrition, but it also drain um, uh, interstitial fluid from the brain parenchyma to the lymph nodes and exchange it with, um, uh, with venous blood. So it's uh, helped to clean up, let's say, our brain from waste. And um, they also, like I said, provide ion, uh, water and ionic balance and pH, it's about from 731 to 734. And a lymph is uh, very sensitive to changes uh, in the Is this pH. lymphatic system uh, also time dependent in terms of its highest activation? In other words, yes. is this mostly happening during sleep? Uh, uh, yes, it has uh, actually uh, some uh, some time uh, schedule, if I can say so. So it's more activated during the sleep. So that's why sleep is so important because it's allowed the system to do the job and uh, take away everything that is unnecessary from the bloodstream and from the brain. So, but um, yeah, uh, so what, uh, how this, and um, why I'd like to say even more about biology of the stuff. Mm-hmm. So uh, we talk about this uh, lymphatic system and cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, so cerebral spinal fluid uh, is created by um, uh, choroid epithelia and they constructed so that uh, they have also very tight connections. So in this um, slide, you can see how it looks like, actually. Uh, the production is, of this cerebral fluid is very, very energy consuming process. So in each of these uh, choroid plexus, they have capillars, which brings some nutrition, right? And uh, then by active or passive transport, uh, choroidal epithelia accept these nutrition, process them, and to to do so, they need a lot of um, ATP to do this process. Mm -hmm. So they need uh, oxygen. It means that if oxygen drop in the bloodstream, then uh, uh, flow of... um, uh, cerebral spinal fluid can also slow him down. And this is not good. So they are very sensitive for O2 as any other system. Now, next uh, slide is talk about brain pulsation phenomenon. Uh, this is also very interesting. Actually, uh, theories and ideas about the pulsation of the brain known for quite long, but now it's get real um, uh, support from the scientific community. And uh, you can see here the latest publication of um, Kivini and group. They uh, try to identify um, how actually, um, what's going on in the brain and uh, how the different uh, um, pulsation occurs and at what frequencies. So what they found that... uh, When you say pulsation, you mean pulsation of the electrical activity? No, this is actually no. This is not electrical activity. This is... uh, um, uh, This is activity of the blood vessels. It's um, in 
integral activity. There is um, blood te tension, there is uh, uh, arterial um, arterial pulsations and there is many other things. So what this group did, they identify uh, what is actually influence uh, uh, this pulsation and how it looks like for different frequencies. And what is important for us and why I talk about this, because this has happened, this pulsation, in very low frequency range exactly in the frequency range of the C potential. So it's happened from zero to 0 0.5 hertz. And uh, these people identify, for example, that there is some cardiac impulse propagation exists in the brain, and they even depict how it looks like and which areas it's uh, uh, involved in the brain. Then there is a respiratory pulse propagation, how it's going on. Uh, then a low frequency wave propagation, what we know from the HRV, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, very low frequency wave propagation. And we can say that actually cerebral spinal fluid dynamic related to the uh, cerebral blood flow, of course. And also it's related to the respiration rate it's uh, related with very low frequency potentials, which is, can be measured from 0 to 0 0.023 hertz and so on. So uh, this just support our idea that DC potential also registered in the same frequency range. We also talk about that DC potential may have not exactly um, directly related with neuronal activation. So it's more about the blood-brain barrier. And even our researchers, uh, before we have this type of um, recent um, discoveries, already talk that actually DC potential measure or reflect the change in pH at the blood-brain barrier level. And if you go a little bit uh, back in our uh, slides, when I talk about glymphatic system, you can see how this um, uh, lymph is propagated and where it's actually located and how, uh, and uh, our electrodes, they are in the frontal area, right? Or classic from Illuminate was vertex tenor. So it's exactly somewhere near the meningeal lymphatic uh, or sinuses. So it's, it's, can, it's quite near of all this um, very low frequency pulsating lymphatic system. Mm. Okay, and uh, now we talk about infra slow frequency potentials. Uh, as I already mentioned, it's registered from 0 to 0 0.5 hertz. It was initially introduced by Ala Chalava in 56 of last century. And uh, we know uh, that this uh, type of um, potential state plays a substantial role in spatial, spatial temporal dynamic organization of the brain. And also this uh, previous research of Kiwi Niemi, what we just discussed 2016, they also claim that um, uh, the wave, um, uh, very low frequency wave distribution related to resting state, silence network, executive network. So it's uh, exactly the special temporal dynamic organization of the brain. It seems like we are talking about the same phenomena. So then we talk uh, also about that um, um, ELF plays a significant role in maintaining the level of cortical excitability or arousal. Of course, so if there is not enough nutrition or uh, there are some uh, changes in uh, circulation of um, cerebral spinal, spinal fluid, we can have uh, 
some deviation in cortical excitabilities. And we also talk that because it's all related with cerebral blood flow, we can assume that cerebral blood flow changes according with cortical excitability. So it's all related. Maintaining the uh, system level organization of the brain activity and reflect interaction between distant functional networks through the recruitment of appropriate functional system during performance of cognitive task. So this is also interesting because actually um, uh, infraslow frequency potentials can be identified not only in the brain, and they can be identified from surface electrode, but also from electrode implanted in different cortical and subcortical structures. And they can also be identified in different organs. So this is some uh, unified system. It's not only specifically target uh, the brain, but also can be registered in other parts of our body. So the next slide is talk, uh, we talk about um, how this DC potential concept developed by Professor Yohino. Uh, she, meant, uh, she was doing uh, quite a lot of research. She has more than 400 journal publications, 12 books, 10 chapters in different scientific books and so on. But of course she was living in Soviet Union, so many of this um, of her work, they are available only in Russian. And the recent book uh, I have is 2018, actually, which is very carefully explained again and again this concept and uh, she had other very new discoveries from her lab and other people who work in the same area. So what was the most important what she identified? Uh, as you can see in this picture, Mm -hmm. uh, just Sorry. one one anecdotal question: Is she yeah. or her team of researchers uh, lately collaborating more with uh, non-Russian scientists, or is it still very much they do their own thing in, with their own team? Uh, unfortunately, yes, she's quite um, uh, let's say not not young anymore, mm -hmm. and it's not easy for her to to do some. Um, uh, that's this kind of uh, yeah. work, yeah. but we are working in close collaboration. So this um, paper, what I uh, add here, it's actually in English, so it's possible to, to find it, and it's 1995. Um, it was published in Neuroscience and Behavioral Physiology. Uh, this is one um, picture of, from her work and her group, where electrode was implanted in human has Parkinson's disease in different parts of the brain. There was multiple electrodes. And then uh, we registered the activity from the deep electrodes in the brain. And same time, uh, we also do recording of neomogram, uh, cardiac contractions, and um, uh, galvanic skin responses. It's uh, also all in this um, picture. So what is the most important? When we present the, some um, you know, pictures that create fear in this person, you can see that there was a shift in activity exactly in DC range in all of these structures. It was in some structures they react more quickly, some a little bit later. They, there was some difference in amplitude, but all of them they have this um, shift. So this is the DC potential. And uh, in the uh, second picture, you can see that spontaneous there is some spontaneous changes which eventually coming in DC, or they can be induced by stimulation. So also uh, she discovered that DC potential indicate the energy metabolism and available brain energetic resources, compensatory adaptive reaction of basic regulatory system. All of this was related with uh, DC potential. So it's some uh, integral um, measure of the state of the brain at this moment. Uh, even though that now we have a lot of publication about DC that we try to understand 
uh, how it related, uh, what uh, what it can mean, and so on. Uh, what was done by Luhina, nobody yet did. And we have these different DC potential types that was carefully identified, and uh, we know uh, with what type of state is related. Remember, we talk about state of performance, right? Mm -hmm. And here we talk about the state of the brain, uh, the state of the regulatory mechanism that involved in uh, maintaining um, uh, the brain homeostasis. Like in optimal situation, we have um, certain parameters of the C potential, but if uh, we have a lower arousal, so not enough activation in the brain, we could see different type of uh, situation. And uh, lower arousal may come because of uh, exhaustion. So the person just not able to recruit a, a, um, sufficiently some functional system and can uh, activate some, um, uh, some um, systems in the brain or in the body to perform uh, actions. Or uh, let's say um, it can still happen, but uh, it, it will uh, come eventually. So it's very slow development in this performance state. Then there can be high arousal, or in, and which are usually related with emotional instability. So if um, we have some overactivation of the limbic system, for example, this can lead to uh, whatever stress, stress reactions, like anxiety, for example. Then we have also instability of arousal. Remember when I when we discuss about the, the, uh, some um, flexibility is absolutely necessary, but if um, we can't uh, provide the stability in any state, then we have this instability, right? And it's usually uh, uh, bring us exhaustion eventually. Have any of these DC potential types that we're looking at? Have any of these been found more predominantly in studies where this, the mental side of the psychological side of fatigue or any psychological diseases have been investigated compared to physical performance and how DC potential behaves in those situations? Mm -hmm. Actually, um, the studies done in different type of people. So, for example, what the latest um, work of Luhina, she worked with children who has uh, developmental disabilities. And usually, most of these kids, they have um, some sort of hypoxia in uterus or during the birth. And then they have some problem with brain development. So we can see and identify and prognose the, uh, their situation based on uh, DC potential type. And also, uh, we can, uh, there was some uh, research done about the fatigue in uh, sport professionals and different sport. But as I mentioned already, many uh, publications done in Russian, and I will show a little later yeah. how it looks like at the moment. Um, so I, I really would would like to have more publication in um, English and that there is other uh, people involved in this research because it's quite interesting and it has um, practical application. Mm. So for like for Russian physiological school, we don't have any surprises actually. Uh, Iluhina has patents for this type of discoveries and many other people also, and they use it daily mm. for in, in, at least for some sport teams and um, to understand, understand something. And there is also a very strong group in Russia. Uh, they using the C potential type to predict the outcome um, after narcosis, for example or in case of some uh, infectional disease or other disease. So if they see a specific type of DC potential, they can already beforehand, before they even start operation, they can predict the outcome of the narcosis. 
Okay, so specific type of DC potential gives you an idea of what is the underlying problem of this individual. Right. So, so in other words, can you distinguish clearly when you measure an athlete and you measure their DC potential, can you with any certainty say that, oh, if I see this kind of curve or this kind of curve, well, this kind is most, most likely due to physical uh, exertion, whereas, for example, this kind, there must have been some psychological impact uh, that this athlete has gone through. Can we say that? No, no. we can't say that. So, um, because it's just one parameter. It's like an EEG, you know, you can have EEG and there can be some abnormalities. That person is totally okay and not no any problems develop. So why we have to treat EEG? But uh, as an instrument to better understand performance and uh, the situation that regulatory systems is totally different. So DC reflect the condition of the regulatory systems. If everything is flexible, if everything is okay, then um, then we can say okay, you can do whatever exercise you need. Mm. But if there was this situation with this runner, what I mentioned today, that he was running in his dream whole night still, and in the morning he feel like he's already exhausted, even before he started to do something, then we may recommend different type of training to support his regulatory system, not to try to push more and to exhaust his resources and to grow his regulatory uh, system control. Hence, it's up to uh, the coach and the athlete to discover what, what was the root cause with just talking, for example, you know, how right. have, looking at previous training schedules and, and lifestyle factors in general to see could this be more due to too much physical training, poor diet, mental fatigue, yeah. whatever that might be. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. We don't know what happened because uh, this person may not sleep, not because he was trained a lot, but mm -hmm. because he was, uh, for example, lost some game recently or because he was uh, fighting with some relative or maybe his kid died and still we don't know how he react emotionally to whatever situation because this is also create activity in the brain is also take some resources and if this event is significant enough it can change um, condition and state so uh, then there is also other slide uh, about the performance and uh, arousal level, but we already more or less uh, discussed about this. So we have um, um, a uh, certain level of uh, activation, optimal performance, but if it's uh, too low or too high, then we can have increased errors or uh, increased omission rate and low or high arousal, yeah. and, uh, of course, which is eventually both of them, and they are not good and they lead to decompensation. But what can happen actually, if somebody stay in the state of low arousal or state of high arousal, in both cases, um, it's already more or less stable condition. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we can see that it's affect uh, performance in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Of course, during the training, uh, we aim to change the regulatory system so that person uh, go to another level of um, uh, his metabolic responses. So it's uh, different uh, for the untrained and trained uh, person. And we know that eventually with training, uh, people, they uh, don't have so much emotional moment with some performance as for example young athletes but still they can be in uh, the wrong compensation level mm -hmm. they can be too aroused or under aroused and we can identify it by the same potential 
this we can say. As I mentioned, there is some uh, specificity in the brain. That's why sometimes we see that we have cardiac readiness, but we don't uh, see the enough resources in the brain to perform something. How I can explain it? Like, for example, um, there were some uh, studies. Uh, if we took, uh, if we take only the muscle and we stimulate this muscle, it can make contraction all the time, actually. But if uh, we feel that we can't do something anymore, or the state of burnout, for example, there is nothing wrong with muscle, but the athlete simply burn out. He can't perform anymore. It's his emotional state. He's already in a uh, in different um, type of uh, arousal, and uh, um, he can't recruit uh, all this physiological system uh, to perform something. So there is some mental effort needed to perform some action. In this case, there is nothing wrong with cardiac system, but the mental and brain systems. They are not in balance. No. So that's that, that's what um, that's the reason why uh, we have these two measurements in omega wave. You, you're mentioning how um, in the research areas yes. done in, in former Soviet Union, Russia, you know there are significant amount done in, in psychology, for example. Um, what kind of uh, what kind of studies? Uh, what focus ha ha have they had in the psychological field when it comes to DC potential? Uh, mostly uh, uh, about the sports psychology, of course. They use it quite a lot, and uh, also performance at the workplace, human resource management. And what, what, what's been kind of the so when you say sports psychology, are we talking about things like motivation or uh, the the perception of effort? What kind of things have they tried to understand by looking at DC potential? Uh, different, different, like uh, all of them basically. So, so in the existing literature, are there any strong conclusions in terms of oh? This seems to DC potential seems to identify this kind of factor quite strongly. Uh, there are conclusions, and uh, as I also mentioned, um, in Russia we don't have to explain DC potential. So the lecture, like I read today, uh, like our students, they get uh, the first course of the universities. So nobody. Uh, claim any like um they don't questioning like where it's come from because tons of literature um written and that's why i have the slide here like uh, dc potential or omega wave potential uh, there is also other names for this uh, phenomenon i just uh, made search by uh, two of these names uh, in our uh, national scientific publication resource called CyberLink. Uh, so you, as you can see, there's thousands of publications and most of them in clinical medicine. Then there is also um, health science, fundamental medicine, psychological science, educational science. Like I say, for example, for people with um, problem in, edu uh, in uh, developmental uh, Development of disabilities or problem to, um, to study something or language problem, whatever. They also uh, tested with DC potential mm -hmm. medical technology. Also, uh, if you if uh, you can see in other countries, the most uh, publication done in neuroscience, because we try to understand the phenomenon of infraslow frequency potential and including DC. That's why so many publications recently published, especially with fMRI, but also with other um, so-called full um, EEG, 
when we can uh, cover full spectra from zero to 2000 hertz. And then we can analyze it, and then we identify this uh, phenomenon of DC potential and try to understand how uh, this is integrated in all um, brain functioning and uh, performance and behavior and so on. So also in medicine and biochemistry and psychology a little. And if you can see then in Scopus, I only write like uh, DC potential and then it's come 228 publications. <laughs> and they started grow from 1992. If you think about, so when the uh, Soviet Union crashed and we get the more interaction with foreign countries. So we bring this idea and um, also Western world to try to understand what it is all about. And you can see that there is quite a lot of publication done, even in few years. Again, depending on name, because people in uh, English literature, they name it in different way. Some they say for slow potential, some say DC, EG potential, some say DC potential, it's, but it's all the same thing. And just about it, uh, which country uses um, this technology and try to understand and who published actually and who give the grants. United States, Finland, second, then Poland, Russian Federation, United Kingdom, Germany, Austria, France, Ireland, and Israel. So if you can see the interest in this idea, in this topic, in understanding um, how we can, um, you know, what it means, this infra-slow fluctuations in the brain, it has quite a lot of interest. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Olga. Thank you. Well,